Okay, everybody, uh, you're all very welcome to the Long Gallery in Stormont Parliament Buildings. I was speaking to one uh, attendee there, and he told me it was his first time here. So it's very interesting, uh, particularly on your first time here. I, I'm chair of the Education Committee, and uh, just this very day, we're having our weekly statutory committee meeting, and uh, it's lasted a few hours there. And then we've had a couple of informal meetings. The statutory committee meeting itself uh, is looking at the programme for government, uh, delivery action plans, and we also heard today from Queen's University um, Social Innovation, Evidence and Social Innovation Unit on nurture units within schools and their effectiveness and uh, in terms of education and cost effectiveness as well. Uh, so, and then we're now into two informal meetings. One was about outdoor education centres. There's a proposed rationalisation of outdoor education centres and a whole focus on outdoor learning. And I'm returning shortly now to the meeting with uh, teaching unions about teachers' pay and a few issues like that, uh, which wouldn't be controversial. <laughs> which would be, which would be controversial. But uh, this is a fascinating seminar and fair play to Ray's and the way that Jane outlined things there. Um, I learned a wee bit more about uh, KS there, the, the type of a programme that it is, just by listening to Jane in her introduction. But as I understand it, our speakers today are going to share their research findings on some of the challenges facing both the executive and the assembly. And there are three separate studies involved, I've been told. And uh, I do know that the Committee for Education and other committees will be interested in having findings brought to their attention. And uh, certainly from the education point of view, I will make sure that today's presentations and policy briefings will be distributed to the 11 members of the Education Committee. And a note from the attendee list, there's uh, officials from the executive, uh, MLA office staff, as well as representatives from the third sector and academia. That's a queer word, that academia, isn't it? But I see presentation one, I think it's up on the screen here, uh, fascinating uh, topic as well. So I don't need to read out the title or the contributors, but uh, the sensitive issue of racism and intolerance towards immigrants and ethnic minorities in our society is to be addressed. Um, coming from County Tyrone, I'm very aware of the work of organisations like OMA Ethnic Community Support Group, um, real good work that they do. And recently I visited a school in South Belfast where, for example, there were 52 Roma children, 52 Roma children, Syrian refugee children, and it was the most amazing international mix you would ever come across. I think maybe 27 uh, nationalities were there. So I think the research examines the influence of factors such as education, socioeconomic status, type of school and religious background on young people's attitudes. So obviously it's important to identify the factors that would drive intolerance. Then presentation two, uh, children's attitudes towards old age, another one, fascinating subject as well, and again, uh, it'll come up in due course. Uh, the, the leading researchers and academics who uh, present that. Um, perception of age is a very interesting one. I um, mean, you wouldn't think I'm, I'm only joking. But uh, my daughter said to me one day, coming out of a shop, she said, uh, I had an ice cream for my daughter. I was coming out of a shop in Coal Island, and uh, I made my way back to the car, and it was dripping, you know. And she said to me, why do you talk to randomers? Randomers was a new word I heard. But even perception of age, you know, um, a 70 year old now, to me, is a relatively young person, <laughs> you know, compared to when you were 19 or when you were 12 or when you were seven, you thought somebody at 70 was ancient. So you don't think people are ancient now when they're 70 or whatever. And then finally, the third presentation, a question of sport. And that used to be the name of a TV programme. It still is, obviously. And uh, in my youth, I missed an entire uh, programme of que a question of sport because I was down in the play park keeping the ball up. You know what I'm talking about, Kevin? <laughs> I was keeping the ball up. And uh, I was that good at it, you know? I did over 2,000. <laughs> and uh, I missed an entire programme of a question of sport. But young people's attitude and perspectives on sport, I think I come from a rural community where there's a very rich attitude on the part of young people and children 
not on the, on the whole, but in general, maybe, uh, towards sport. And uh, I just want to tell you another silly story before I depart and let you get down to the really serious business. I heard a good one about uh, uh, an older man from the United States. He arrived in uh, Castle Dawson, Balaha area, and he, he met an older man, another older man, and he said, did you know Seamus Heaney personally? And the local man said, don't mention that man's name to me. He lost us a very important football match when we were 17 years of age, apparently. He carried the ball over the line, and it was a disputed goal and all that sort of stuff. So sport can take on an importance for young people and for older people that is uh, beyond uh, its impressions. So with that, I wish you well in terms of your deliberations today. And uh, I'll just stay sure for a short while and return to hear what the teachers are saying about teachers' pay, if you don't mind. So thank you very much. You're all very welcome. I'm Steffi Dupler, and um, a lot of this um, research work I've actually done um, while I was still at Queen's University Belfast. One of my co-authors, Dr. Ian Shuttleworth, is also uh, here in the last row. Um, and I've done this with colleagues at Queen's and Newcastle University. Okay, um, how does this work? Um, click on this. Ah, okay. Um, good. So negativity towards immigrants and uh, racial and ethnic outgroups in Northern Ireland, uh, it has been a, long, um, a problem for a long time. It's, it's well known. There have been media accounts for many years um, on this topic, and the media discourses uh, have been so frequent and so strong in the last couple of years that Northern Ireland has even been dubbed the race-hate capital of not just the UK, but of Europe. Um, there um, have been recently discourses over the question, is racism the new sectarianism, or how strongly is um, racial prejudice and racism related and interlinked with sectarianism in Northern Ireland? Is this a Northern Ireland phenomenon, or uh, does the same problem persist elsewhere as well? Um, and indeed, not just in, in the press and in public discourses uh, is, is this uh, has been treated as a question, but also um, academics like John Brewer have um, emphasized that there is a strong correlation between um, sectarianism and um, anti-immigrant attitudes and negativity towards outgroups in general. Now, um, these are just a couple of images to, um, thinking about what might actually drive negativity towards ethnic minorities and immigrants in Northern Ireland. Is it sectarianism? There is a picture a colleague of mine has taken um, in, in the uh, preparations, uh, when, when the preparations happened to the 11th night bonfire, where you can see on one of these planes saying foreigners out, and you see uh, these bonfires that are probably really well known to everybody with an uh, um, uh, Irish flag, and then next to it is an ISIS flag. It's a bit, a bit hidden behind that, so you see um, from both sides of the divide, uh, you, can, you can see these uh, bonfires where you, where you have then um, um, emblems and uh, Im images um, that are targeted at um, the significant other or at outgroups in general. Um, but uh, maybe lack of education might um, be a driver of um, anti-immigrant and, and racially prejudiced attitudes as well as poverty and other factors. Um, so this talk will focus on, on two levels. We're looking at the macro level and looking at racially motivated hate crimes um, in electoral wards, in areas in Northern Ireland, and I've tried to map them. Um, and on the individual level, we're looking at negative attitudes towards racial and ethnic, mi racial and ethnic minorities um, among Northern Ireland's population aged 16 to 65 plus. Um, I'm doing time series analysis um, of um, cross-sectional survey data um, of um, hate crimes, but also um, of the data of the uh, Young Life and Times survey um, and the Northern Ireland, um, um, Northern Ireland uh, Life and Times survey. Um, and um, these surveys are carried out or are convened um, at Queen's University Belfast. Dirk Schubert, one of the presenters here, is also involved in these surveys and convenes them. So um, if we have a discussion about the data, um, he will be a, a good person to talk to as well. Um, so prior academic research found negative attitudes towards immigrants to be related to um, 
education, low education, deprivation and status anxiety, people who fear for their housing, fear for their jobs, are already in a position where uh, their jobs may be threatened um, or where they are already unemployed, might be more likely to be prejudiced towards outgroups, um, but also a lack of contact to minority members. Not having enough interactions might actually be related to prejudice. Um, and as I said, Brewer, Knox, and others found um, sectarian attitudes to be strongly related to racism. Um, and some said um, that in their findings, um, Protestants tended to be more uh, likely to be prejudiced than Catholics and others. Um, um, knowledge of this is important, of course, to policymakers and to anybody who is interested in, um, in community relations and positive relationships between the different groups in society. So we take a look at the macro level. These are just hate crimes across Northern Ireland as a whole. Um, and um, it's just a quick time series of um, the blue line is sectarian hate crimes, the red one is racist hate crimes, and the uh, brown one is homo-negative hate crimes targeted at homosexuals. And these are data that are supplied by the Northern Ireland police, and you can download them at NINES, at NISRA. Um, and you can see there is the, a quite worrying increase. Um, so racist hate crimes doubled uh, in only three years from uh, 456 to 920 one between um, 2011 and 2014. Sectarian hate crimes um, showed uh, a rise, an increase of 15%, but uh, homonegativity, you can see um, there is a flat line. There is no increase there. So m these numbers are indeed a cause for concern, but we can also see there is a slight decrease from 2014 to 15, and uh, we have to see if this trend persists after the Brexit vote. So the next, um, the next year or the next two years of data will give us more knowledge. Um, now, I've mapped uh, the occurrences, um, numbers of hate crimes per electoral ward, and I've also looked at uh, the percentages of immigrants living in these wards. So on the left-hand side in pink, uh, pinkish colors is uh, immigrant numbers. The darker red, the higher the percentage. And um, on uh, the right-hand side uh, in blue, um, the darker blue, the, the more hate crimes. It's the map of hate crimes. And you see um, it looks like an overlap. One would be tempted to say, oh, uh, hate crimes uh, tend to happen where immigrants live or where uh, ethnic minorities uh, that are non-British, uh, non-UK, and non-Irish. So I looked at uh, minorities that are not from um, anywhere within the UK or Ireland. Um, and um, this is the percent change in immigrant numbers um, and the change in hate crimes over time from 2000. So the change in immigrants is from 2001 to 2011. It's based on the census. And the change in hate crimes is based um, on the police data, which goes to uh, 2014. And here you can see that, um, yes, um, there is still this overlap with some regions where immigrants live, but there is something else going on. It clusters in inner city areas of Belfast and Derry. And in some areas where you have an increase in immigrant numbers, you actually see a decrease in hate crimes, areas around Cookstown and Craigavon, where you have a lot of meat processing industries, a lot of Eastern European uh, migrants have moved there. Ruth McAreevy has written papers on this. And um, you see a decrease in these areas, whereas in other areas uh, surrounding Belfast, um, you see increases, but not an increase in immigrant numbers. So there may very well be other things, uh, for example, deprivation that uh, play into this. Um, rather than just immigrant numbers. Um, and if we just zoom into inner city Belfast and Derry, um, then we might see a familiar picture. Uh, you might be more familiar with uh, neighborhood level, uh, level data in Northern Ireland than I am. But these are also neighborhoods that have high levels of unemployment, high levels of deprivation, where there are also higher levels of overall crime and overall negativity perhaps going on. My co-author is shaking his head. No, you're not shaking. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's good. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, so I'm th I'm, I think that um, there is quite a, a probably a relationship there with deprivation. And we did some multivariate modeling where deprivation seemed to be stronger, um, a stronger explanatory factor than the occurrence of, 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 of a moving in of immigrants as such. Um, and for comparison, if we look at multiple area deprivation, NISRA's multiple area deprivation index, you can see that um, in areas where, where um, indeed uh, that are amongst the most deprived on this index, uh, these are also areas or, or a lot of the areas where you have an increase in hate crimes are exactly in these hot spots of deprivation. This is just to give an overview over um, Northern Ireland within the rest of the UK. And you see um, these are survey data. Um, so um, we're looking at negativity towards ethnic minorities in the British Social Attitude Survey the no and the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey. Um, the red one is would not accept an Eastern European as a relative by marriage. Blue is I would not accept a Muslim as a relative by marriage. Yellow, um, in the yellow bar is immigrants take jobs away from people who were born in Britain or Northern Ireland. These uh, items were asked in a very similar way in both surveys, which is why we can compare this. And Britain's culture is generally undermined by immigrants, is this turquoise uh, bar. And you see that there is a difference between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Northern Ireland isn't in general the race hate capital. So there are um, in Wales, East Midlands and the Northwest, there is a problem with anti-immigrant attitudes and attitudes, um, but general attitudes towards foreigners and immigrants. But in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland has um, the highest percentages of those uh, endorsing anti-Muslim attitudes and, um, and attitudes towards specific outgroups like Eastern Europeans and Muslims, um, not so much immigrants in general. But it would be very short-sighted to just say uh, Northern Ireland would be the race hate uh, capital of the UK. You see by these numbers that's not the case. We have to look a little bit deeper and other regions do have problems with this as well. Um, and we saw these numbers were quite worrying. It's 60% of the population uh, wouldn't want to um, have um, a marriage or wouldn't want to have someone marrying into the family who is a Muslim. Um, so a summary on the, of the macro level findings, there are increases in Northern Ireland between 2011 and 2014, but a decrease by 15, so let's hope the decrease uh, will last. Um, there are different patterns on the, on the ward level, a concentration in inner city deprived areas, um, and areas that have high and increasing numbers of immigrants also tend to have high levels of deprivation. Um, there is a tendency um, that areas that already had elevated numbers of hate crimes also have rising numbers between 2011 and uh, 14. Um, and in some areas, there was an, an improvement. Um, and maybe policymakers might know why. Maybe there have been initiatives that were successful. I wouldn't know. Um, so if we now look at the individual level, at survey data, so we look at uh, the results from the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey and the Young Life and Time Survey. Those are representative random probability samples of the population of uh, people, of young people aged 16 and of um, adults aged uh, 18 to 65 plus. Um, and um, I'm looking at our uh, younger cohorts becoming more tolerant. Um, and what factors might actually influence tolerance towards outgroups. And this is a time series from 2005 to 2015 um, of both um, the red line of both surveys, the Young Life and Times and the Northern Ireland Life and Times survey. And the red line is the 16-year-old cohort. Um, and the uh, blue, this um, st striking um, blue color is um, 18 to 24 year old category. Um, and uh, we see quite um, a sharp increase, particularly among the cohort of 18 to 24 year olds in the attitude in relation to race and ethnicity. Um, I prefer to stick with people of my own kind. Um, whereas the 16 year old cohort is quite tolerant. You have, uh, it's between 10 and 15% with some fluctuation, but it's actually quite stable and it's the most tolerant cohort of them all. But um, this increase between 2011 and 2014 is quite sharp for the youngest adult cohort. Um, you have some increase in older cohorts as well, but it's not as, uh, it's not as sharp. 
Um, so um, for the 18 to 25 year olds, it's an increase, a, three, a threefold increase almost from 13% in 2010 to uh, 34 um, in 2014. Um, and that's quite worrying. I also, for comparison, looked at, or we looked at, sectarian, uh, a sectarian attitude. I prefer to live in a neighborhood with only people of my own religion, um, because um, there was a literature saying uh, there is a strong overlap. And indeed, the pattern is very similar for the two attitudes. Um, they follow similar patterns. Um, but in general, older cohorts tend to be more intolerant um, than younger cohorts. And um, yeah, if we look at concrete attitudes to, um, towards Muslims and Eastern Europeans, it's the same pattern of this time we need to um, think in the reverse. It says I would accept a Muslim as a close friend and I would accept an Eastern European as a close friend. So uh, a decline in acceptance means a, a rise in intolerance. So it's, it's a decline in acceptance over time. And it's particularly sharp again between uh, for, for the last couple of years for the 18 to 24 year olds. Um, we don't have data on these particular um, variables for the 16 year cohort because it wasn't asked in the Young Life and Time survey. Um, and also the, the levels of acceptance towards Muslims is lower than the level of acceptance towards Eastern Europeans. Um, I've done, we've done uh, some um, regression analysis. This is quite a busy table, so bear with me. I'll just talk you through what's important in these tables. Um, these are um, regression models um, with more than uh, just the one variable. So I've con we've controlled for, for sex and age and uh, do, uh, does the respondent live in a small town or a rural area, contact opportunities and lots of things. Interestingly, with regards to schooling, so living in a, um, or being schooled in a Protestant school as opposed to Catholic school, Catholic school is left out of the model as the reference category, you see it doesn't matter statistically. So there's no statistical difference between um, pupils of Protestant schools as opposed to Catholic schools or integrated mixed schools. So the the model number one just compared um, the religious, um, well, um, majority of the school. Um, and the second model looked at grammar schools versus integrated schools. And um, you can see that um, in grammar schools, or grammar schools versus integrated schools versus schools that aren't integrated, and grammar schools stand out. So a grammar school, um, pupils of grammar schools who are 16 years old are more likely to be, or are less likely to be intolerant, are less likely to um, have unfavorable feelings towards uh, ethnic minorities. But integrated schooling as such isn't statistically significant, which I found surprising. Um, and we could um, discuss um, later on why might this be the case. Um, but having contact opportunities with um, out-group members, with members of ethnic minorities, is strongly negatively related to being, more, to being intolerant, socializing with ethnic minority members, um, and um, um, not having negative attitudes towards integrated schooling. So, so attitudes towards outgroups, towards others, and um, having no sense of neighborhood belonging, being unhappy with the neighborhood I live in is strongly related to being intolerant towards outgroups. Um, but living close to a peace line or living in a segregated area um, as such isn't. And also living in a Protestant versus Catholic area, it, it depends on what model we run. It's not a very strong connection. Um, if we look at the adult sample, that's um, this, a very similar regression model. It can't be identical because some variables were asked in a different way and some variables weren't asked in this survey. Um, this is the adult survey from the Northern Ireland Life and Time survey, and it's an OLS regression again. And um, what stands um, out is that having attended a mixed school, it's um, this one in the middle, having attended a mixed um, school um, is negatively related for the adult sample to um, being intolerant towards ethnic outgroups or having negative feelings towards, towards ethnic minority members is the question in the survey. So uh, for the adult sample, mixed schooling does matter. Um, and again, as in the youth sample, having contact opportunities um, does uh, matter and um, education is a strong explanatory. So having higher education, having better education. Um, and in the adult sample, um, 
Protestant identity is um, positively related to being more likely to be intolerant, um, which in my opinion is, um, is connected to deprivation. It's, it's uh, Protestant youth in deprived areas. There's lots of other factors playing into this. Being Protestant as such doesn't explain it, of course. That would be silly. Um, so we have to interpret these coefficients based on theory and uh, use our common sense, of course. Um, if we, so as a summary, if we look at uh, cohort differences, um, we saw some worrying increases in negative attitudes towards racial and ethnic minorities, particularly among uh, young adults, 18 to 25 year olds, between 2010 and 14. Um, and um, we found that the youngest cohort of 16 year olds does not exhibit this trend. They are the most tolerant cohort of them all, which I think gives us some, some reason to be optimistic about the future. Um, and this is good news. Um, in general, younger cohorts tend to be more tolerant than older cohorts. Um, there is some good news. There is a decrease in negativity between 2014 and 15. But we have to question whether this will persist after the Brexit vote, because in England and other parts of the UK, you saw an, a spike in negativity towards immigrants and um, ethnic outgroups right after the Brexit vote. So future waves of the data will, will tell us um, whether, whether that trend is replicated here as well. Let's hope not. Um, younger cohorts are consistently more tolerant. Um, and in the multivariate uh, regressions, what we basically found is education matters, the quality of schooling matters, so grammar schools, quality of schooling matters more for the young, uh, um, for the young life and time survey cohort, for the 16-year-olds, um, than integrated schooling as such. But for the adult, school, uh, adult sample, integrated schooling was related to being more tolerant. Um, and um, increased contact with members of, of, of ethnic minorities and having a positive sense of belonging with my local neighborhood, feeling comfortable with my local neighborhood, are strongly related to being more tolerant. Um, so what can policymakers do, since this is a, is a knowledge exchange seminar, um, I think what should be done is to strengthen um, the supply of a high quality education. I think integrated schooling is still important, but we have to see why is it, uh, doesn't it stand out in the 16 year cohort, maybe um, because it's already in general a lot more tolerant than adult cohorts. Maybe the success has already played out into this cohort and we are looking at a successful policy that had been carried out over the last uh, longitudinal um, data, over the last years. Um, so policies should aim at reducing poverty, I think, and unemployment across Northern Ireland and should try to boost high quality education and especially try to do something um, to um, counteract the clustering of poverty and deprivation in certain neighborhoods because um, I see a strong overlap between deprivation and intolerance on the neighborhood level. And I think that's where someone, that's where maybe one could do something. Um, so uh, thanks for listening. Um.